Good afternoon. My name is Sheldon Drucker, and I'm fortunate to be the president of Fairleigh Dickinson University. And so on behalf of FDU, I welcome you to a very interesting hour or so. We know that this will be a very insightful discussion with a very extraordinary individual. I want to especially welcome members of the university's field program, the Florham Institute for Lifelong Learning. These seniors truly epitomize the joy of learning, and they play an important role in our university community. We're so pleased that you all can be here today. As you can imagine, we are tremendously honored to be hosting David Gergen, not once, but twice today, including an evening at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. David Gergen, as you know, is part of a, of a terrific lineup of guests, and this, the first season of the New Jersey Speaker Series. The Speaker Series brings to New Jersey a great lineup of very important and prominent individuals. And thanks to that program, today we're able to bring David Gergen to campus to personally speak with us. David is one of the most experienced and most influential political commentators in our nation. To properly introduce him, I'm proud to welcome an outstanding student here on our Florham campus, Jamie Mulrooney. She's a junior majoring, majoring in communications with minors in public relations and broadcasting. Jamie is extremely active, serving our campus and the greater community. She's a member of the Florham Program Committee and Thai Theta Alpha sorority and also served as an orientation leader on the Florham campus. Among her favorite experiences include participating in service trips, and she's helped uh, construct homes in Arizona for Native Americans. And last month, she traveled to the Dominican Republic and volunteered in an orphanage for impoverished children. Following her education, Jamie plans to enter a career in television. Please welcome Jamie Mulrooney. Thank you very much, President Drucker. Now a senior political analyst for CNN, David Gergen enjoyed an outstanding career in politics, working in four different administrations and serving as presidential advisor for US presidents of both parties, including Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. He began a career in journalism in the 1980s and has served as chief editor of US News and World Report. He has twice won the prestigious Peabody Award for election team coverage, once with the McNeil Lair Report and once with CNN. In addition to his work with CNN, he now serves as a professor of public service and co-director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. Before I introduce David Gergen, a note about our moderator, FDU's own Dr. Bruce Peabody, a professor of political science. Now please welcome David Gergen. Thank you. So I'll kick things off. Thanks so much for coming, and thank you so much, David, for joining us this afternoon. We're excited to chat with you. I thought I'd note uh, at the outset that I'm under the delusion, even though this is the first time I've met you, that we've had a relationship for many years. And the reason for that is there's three, three reasons. The first is that I grew up on uh, Rogers Lane in Wallingford, right across the street from your brother, who was a uh, colleague of my father's at Swarthmore College. Second, as our uh, student uh, introducer just noted, you've won several Peabody Awards. So as a Peabody, I'm, I'm quite, sure, <laughs> quite sure I had something to do with that, although I'm a little fuzzy on the details. <laughs> and third, and I guess most important uh, for myself, and I think for many people in the room, we, you led us into public affairs. Uh, for myself, I, on many Friday evenings, I watched you joust with Mark Shields and make a convincing and quiet case that it was urgent that we pay attention to public affairs and, and world matters more generally. So thank you. I think that's uh, in the very best tradition of broadcast journalism and something we should all be grateful for. Bruce, so, that, well, Bruce thank you. Thank and you. I, it's a delight to be here at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson. Uh, and I want to thank Shelley for your, your uh, kind introduction. And he introduced me. We had a moment to talk 
uh, before coming out. Uh, but Jamie, I especially want to thank you. You're off to a terrific start. You took control of that microphone like that. It was sort of blew me away. I thought, whoa, you know, strong presence. Uh, but I also want to uh, uh, greet those of you who are here with the Lifelong Learning uh, Program, which I think is, is very, very important. We've started an initiative. I, I really, I've been involved, but there, there's a woman named Rosabeth Moss Cantor at the Harvard Business School who's really taken the lead uh, for something, uh, an initiative called the Advanced Leadership Initiative, and it's for, the notion is the same that you have here, and that is that Colleges and universities uh, traditionally educated people at the beginning of their careers and then for over a number of years have been working on executive education programs for people in mid-career. Uh, and now we're experimenting, and you're part of the, uh, the cutting edge of this, uh, for people who are basically at the end of their first careers but have something more to offer and what to do in life that they really want to give back usually in some fashion. Uh, and so we have a group of people who have come to Harvard for who usually somewhere in their late 50s, 60s, maybe early 70s, and they come back and they spend a year, uh, and they usually go off and have a project in the nonprofit sector that they want to do. Uh, but they have found those, that experience enormously rewarding, and I hope and trust that uh, you found the same thing here at Fairleigh Dickinson. It's, an important, it's important for all of us to learn, to know, and there are a number of students here as well, I notice they're further away. That means they can hear better. I've, that's been my experience <laughs> in life. Closer to the food. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, but in uh, any event, it's important for us all to appreciate that given the enormous changes, the relentless set of changes that are occurring in the world, you really do have to be continuously educated in, in order to understand the world in which you're living. And those of us who lived a little longer do have the, you know, the, um, for good fortune of having seen enough that you see patterns you might not have seen when you're younger. On the other hand, we don't have the energy and the promise that all these young people do. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Uh, but I also appreciate, Bruce, you talking about uh, uh, the McNeil Lair. I did get a lot of my start with uh, Jim Lair and, and Robin McNeil way back when, and especially with uh, Mark Shields. And Mark Shields was a, uh, uh, was a very dear friend in, in television. And I, I always used to tell him, you know, I was sort of the person slightly to the right of center, and he was the person left of center. And I told him how remarkable it was when we ran around the country and how many people came up and said to me, oh, I watch you in my living room every Friday night. And how many people came up, there were Democrats, came up to Mark and said, oh, I watch you in my bedroom every Friday night. I just thought it, was, it pointed out the difference between the parties pretty well. Over to you. Terrific. So, okay. so I'll, I'll ask some questions, and we'll have a uh, conversation, as I think this is billed. And, uh, while a professor's notion of a conversation is often uh, kind of one way, we'll open things up to a more general dialogue. Uh, I, 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 things, I think it's called cold calling. Oh, go ahead. Cold calling. I'm yeah, happy yeah, to do yeah, that. Yeah, I do yeah. that in my classes regularly. Yeah. So let me start with a pretty coarsely grained question, pretty, pretty broad sure. question. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll borrow a line or a, an observation made by a colleague of yours at the Kennedy School, mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Nye, who said something to the effect of, uh, that were, I think every uh, generation or maybe every uh, group thinks it's at a unique moment, but, but we're at an important uh, moment. I think we can, we can make that case. And for Nye, part of that singularity involves uh, the question of the U.S. as a world power. And he says we're in this funny moment where the U.S., there's no longer another hegemon. There's not yet another hegemon to, to challenge our rule, but we're weak, uh, we're not strong enough to uh, ably deal with the important international problem. So I wonder what you think about that. Is, is Nye onto something? Are we in a uh, curious transition phase where the U.S. is uh, too strong to be challenged but too weak to do the big work that needs to be done? Well, there is an interesting argument, and uh, Joe Nye is a dear friend. Uh, and uh, there is this argument that has been for some time that government in general has become too big to deal with small problems and too small to deal with the big problem. Um, and I think there's some, some truth to that. Is our power shifting? Uh, Joe would argue that it, how, how much power we have is you should look at it in different ways. If you talk about military power, we're still by far and away the most powerful nation on the globe. and we. Our military budget is equal to the next 10 nations combined in terms of their military spending. So that gives you some sense of our, our uh, transcendent military power. If you talk about economic power, 
there are, you know, there are half a dozen areas of the world that are certainly China uh, and Japan and, and Europe uh, share power uh, with us. Uh, and then you have the other countries that are coming up quickly, like Brazil. Um, so that is, and then if you go down to another level, which is, is more about sort of uh, other activities that take place, uh, given the internet and everything like that, then power is very splintered, as you know. But there's a lot of organizations, a lot of people in, in positions of power, quote, no longer have carry the respect that they once did, and they're not seen, they're seen with much, through much more cynical eyes. There is a real sense around the globe that our political leaders are failing us. It's not just the United States. It, it's shared worldwide. There's an international poll that was taken by the World Economic Forum. Like 76, I think it's 80 percent of the people in the, in the world think their governments are, are not working well. Uh, uh, and many people think business is not, business leadership is also failing, although business enjoys a slightly higher uh, degree of respect uh, than, than do about political leaders. Having said all that, I think what's really important is the, even though the United States retains all this military power, the willingness to follow. You know, a leader needs followers. By definition, a leader has followers, right? The willingness to follow our lead has certainly diminished around the world. And there's a greater sense that that we're a world power about to leave, we're in the process of leaving the stage, and that China is in the process of coming onto the stage. Uh, and that means that people are looking at us and not sure whether they want to invest heavily in our futures or not. So uh, look at you, what's going on with Ukraine right now, that, uh, that uh, Andre Merkel and Hollande of France are independently negotiating with Putin uh, over the future of Ukraine, and the United States is not even at the table. I mean, we weren't invited in, and Merkel has made it quite clear she does not favor what Washington is now talking about, which is potentially give some arms to the Ukrainian government, uh, and they're trying to cut an independent deal. Um, uh, and I think that that is, uh, you can see increasingly uh, in the Middle East, um, a sense that among our friends, that we're not as reliable a power as we once were. You know, when King Abdullah died in Saudi Arabia, the story has now emerged that he's actually quite angry with our government. And when the last time our president went to Saudi Arabia, the, the king normally escorts the president of the United States back to the airport in a limousine and they talk. Uh, the, the, the king refused to go to the airport with him. Um, and that's because, in part, uh, they felt we were an unreliable ally, uh, and that view was strongly reinforced when Mubarak fell in Egypt. Uh, Mubarak had been a friend of ours, a stout friend of the United States for a long, long time, and were we friends with, a, with an authoritarian? Yes, we were. That happens like in a lot of places, right? Uh, and Mubarak was certainly an authoritarian. Some would call him a dictator. Um, but he had been a friend of the United States for a long time, and the Saudis thought that friendship was very important. And when Mubarak got in trouble, they thought we threw him under a bus in two weeks. That, and we didn't even give him a way out. I mean, we didn't. Now, Americans look at that and say, well, of course we sympathize with the Arab Spring. Of course we sympathize with the people in Tahir Square. You know, they, they represented a sense of sort of a new democracy. But we rushed to them, away from our friend, and the, to the Saudis and to others in the Gulf, it, it means we're less reliable than we once were. So there are big questions about American leadership all around the world. And, and do you think that uh, that diminished status, diminished stature internationally, is that a function of leadership missteps? Does that reflect changing political realities in the United States? Is that a function of our diminished uh, power, not militarily, but uh, economically and with respect to our overall national profile? I think it's been a, a combination of things that, that uh, we, it, it, in part, it's the world has changed itself. It, we, we emerged from the, the, the World War II, of course, as a great superpower because so many other nations were destroyed. Um, and over time, we helped Europe back on its feet through the Marshall Plan and other steps. Uh, and you know, Russia grew to be a, 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 a superpower in terms of its military. Uh, and so the, the stage was a little more crowded. 
but then when the when, and and eventually it was sort of seemed to be the Soviet Union versus the West and the United States is leader of the West and then when the wall crumbled uh, and the Soviet Union crumbled uh, there was a sense that we had emerged as the sole superpower as the hyperpower as the hegemonic power and there were people who argued you know on the right in the United States that this was our moment Charlie Krauthammer for example and Joe and I argued vociferously against this uh, that this was the moment for the United States to be the world power and to have the American empire, which was, I thought, sort of a loony notion. Um, but that was going to be our empire moment. Well, that was back in the 1990s. And, uh, t t you know, 25 years later, uh, clearly there's a sense our power is now in decline. So I think it's partly a question of sort of world events, but it's also a, a, the, the loss of uh, faith or in our reliability and our wisdom as a leader. You know, there's, it's not a question of how whether you lead, whether you have the power to lead, but whether res people respect you. And we've had two presidencies back to back now in which one president, George W. Bush, was seen by the world as being rash and petulant and too interventionist and jumping into Iraq, uh, a war that you know, has cost us and cost us. Uh, and then we, the pendulum swung and Barack Obama is seen by the world as going too far the other way, uh, being too passive. Uh, and not, not willing to grasp the, the, the nettle. Uh, setting up, you know, drawing a red line in Syria, and when they cross the red line, uh, magically letting it disappear. Uh, and that, that cost him a lot. So we've, I, think, I think what's important now is that we steady up. Uh, and if I may say so, if, if you look ahead to the 2016 elections, and I'm sure we'll get to that, but if it comes out that it's Hillary versus Jeb, I'll just have to tell you, I think I, you can make your choice about which one's a better candidate. Uh, but I would tell you, I would go to sleep at night before the election comfortable that whoever wins, we're going to have a steadier hand on the wheel. We're going to have a steadier hand on the wheel. And I, I think that would be good for the country. I think people need to think we have, we're more strategic, that we're calm about things, that we're thoughtful about it. Uh, and that we're also willing to be tough-minded and tough when we have to be. That there are certain, you know, you, diplomacy, as I learned in past administrations, and I thought Bill Clinton was our last effective, really effective president, um, and, and George H. W. Bush was a very steady hand on foreign policy. Uh, and so that Barack Obama very much uh, uh, respects George H. W. Bush. Um, but I think what we need now is a sense of a steadier hand, and, and, I, and I think, I hope we're heading in that direction. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll use your invitation then to make a transition to uh, domestic politics to some degree. So in 2000, uh -huh. you wrote that, quote, a successful woman in the presidency could do more to cleanse and lift the quality of our public life than almost anything imaginable. So I want to know if you stand by that statement. If so, if you are going to be faxing your resume to uh, <laughs> the Clinton uh, campaign after this talk. Well, uh, I don't think she wants to hear from me. But the, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I had the opportunity the privilege working uh, in, with the uh, Clintons in the early 90s when they were at the White House. And uh, um, they, they were both sort of freshly arrived in Washington. And, and we, he and I had been friends for a, a a fair, fair number of years. And uh, he asked me to come join him about six months in. And uh, at that time, Hillary was fairly new to, to Washington. And she was very feisty. And uh, I, we found that we disagreed on about six issues out of every four. Uh, uh, whether it went from Whitewater to, uh, to health care. Uh, uh, but I came to admire her as a fighter. And she has strong beliefs. And uh, I admire people who have, you know, who thought about things. And she strong passion. She's passionate about the empowerment of women, which I salute. She's, in pas she's passionate about improving the lives of children, which I salute. I think that she would bring that kind of uh, interest to the White House. I think she's become a much better uh, a political politician than she was when she first arrived. Uh, when she first arrived in Washington, she was, you know, it's, it's a complicated place. And she herself, I mean, she, we had conversations about this. And, you know, it's hard to get used to how power is exercised in Washington. 
and she had a bit of a tin ear. He was the one who was had a, a finely tuned ear uh, for politics when he got there. Um, and uh, but but I must say I think she's become a lot better at it. And um, I think you know she just she's learned her way around. She's got the experience now, which I think has made a big difference. I think she would. She's much better prepared to be president now than she was before she was in the Senate, before she was Secretary of State. Those were good jobs for her to have, good preparation for being president. So I, there are a lot of things about her that I uh, admire. Um, I, I, here's my the question I have right now. I had thought when I wrote that about the coming of a woman, I, I continue to believe that breaking up the old boys club it's a good thing to do. I thought it was a good thing to have an African American come president. I'm from the South, grew up in a segregated white South, and uh, I thought it was an act of national redemption to have Barack Obama as president. I've since parted company with him on a number of issues. Um, but in any event, I was glad he was in the White House. I think having a woman in the White House would be a very, very good thing. And we can see in Angela Merkel uh, yet another example of women who lead really, really well. I think that she's a very strong leader. And we've seen that in a number of other cases. Uh, what I'm less clear about is that, is that we would get past polarization. I thought there was a time when the coming of Hillary maybe could, could and I still hope this, but I was, I was more confident six months ago, a year ago, that the coming of a Hillary Clinton uh, would help to bridge the divides and, and the distrust. You know, she was a, and in the Senate, she, she built bridges. You know, she got close to John McCain, and they liked to knock back a few drinks at night. You know, when they were on the road, they enjoyed each other's company. Uh, and I think there are other Republicans who, who respect her, uh, uh, which I like. But the country, you know, sh she still remains a more polarizing figure than I had, had hoped. I, is this me, or? Uh, <laughs> oh, you're, you're good. Uh, Hillary's trying to cut me off here now. And I, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, she's, uh, so, you know, I, I, and I also have a lot of respect for, for Jeb Bush. So I, we can talk about that. But I, I, I'm, I'm not as confident that she can bridge the divides as I once was. I still have hope. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I know this. I know she would try. I've actually asked her this question. Uh, uh, how, uh, look, I can see you getting elected. Can you govern? That's the really important question. You know, it, can anybody govern in this environment? And, uh, you know, it's, I, I happen to be a short-term pessimist, but a long-term optimist about America. I think the next few years are going to continue to be pretty rough. Okay, well, let's, let's pick up on that then. Yeah, okay. So when I'm driving around the highways and byways of New Jersey, I will sometimes come across a bumper sticker you've no doubt seen, which has uh, various uh, religious symbols uh, arrayed around the word coexist. It strikes me that that's a pretty low bar to set, right? Coexist is, is just asking for civility, tolerance, maybe not being at each other's throats. And I wonder, is that even an aspiration for us with respect to, to partisanship and, and polarization, as you put it? I mean, where, what are we going to, how bad is the problem? One of my students, Jessica Marshall, asked whether this is a problem that's as uh, deeply embedded in Washington as it is uh, clearly portrayed as being in the media, or if there's some exaggeration. I have my own sense of that, but I wanted to hear from you, you know, how bad is the problem, and if we're going to be long-term optimists, how are we going to overcome the most divided Congress we've seen since <laughs> the world, Second World War? Well, I, look, it, it is, it's a serious problem, and it, it goes to the question of, uh, I, I think, world leadership. And if you're dysfunctional at home, uh, it, uh, if we once were held up as a model of democracy, and after the war, you know, we like to be evangelical in different parts of the world to say, copy America. Well, who wants to copy American politics right now? And it's, yeah, you know, there's a, the, the view that capitalism and our form of democracy is, you know, is, is now the, is the reigning view. It no longer is true. You know, Francis Fukuyama wrote this book about the end of history as if, uh, democracy and free markets had triumphed. Uh, and now we find that there are alternative models. There's a Beijing model for growth uh, that a lot of people in China are doing much, much better, thank you very much. They don't have much economic, they don't have much political freedom, right? I mean, they have virtually no political freedom. Uh, and they don't have religious freedom. 
Uh, but for other nations, they're, they're, they're at least building an economy uh, that is, is stronger than ours by some measures right now. So it, it, this dysfunctionality is a serious issue. I would like to think that somebody, you know, the next president can, whoever it is, can, can perhaps make it better. Um, but I almost think it's generational. Um, I, I think it's going to take, I think the, the, the current generation is nowhere, and I'm going to be speaking about this tonight. Uh, but I came to Washington when the World War II generation was running things. And uh, these were essentially men and women who came of age. They were young during the war. Most of them served in the war. Uh, and I thought that was a great generation. You know, the genera it, it, it wasn't perfect, but it was a great generation. And now we have the baby boomers and, and, and some preemies like me uh, who are, are sort of running things. And I don't think we've done a very good job with it. Uh, I have great faith and I am greatly encouraged by the quality of what I see in the younger generation. And I don't know this to campus well, but I can just tell you that on campus after campus, just like this, there are people emerging who are very promising and really care about the country and remind me a lot of the World War II generation. And they give me great, they're one of the reasons for hope about the future. Jamie may be one of them. I think, you know, you know stands up here, she's pert and she goes to it and, you know, she cares and she wants to get into TV, which is good for her. It's, it's a rough road, but good for her. Um, and uh, there, are, there are a lot of young people like Jamie out there who are extremely promising. So is, does that mean we're going to have a phase of just grin and bear it? That, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about how, you know, how might you counsel a uh, candidate to break through that, uh, that partisanship? Uh, you know, we can't, can't wait it out for four well, years. Uh, well, right? you can't, well, you can't. Well, you can't but but let, let's remember, we've been through these kind of periods before. This is not the only time we've had dysfunctionality. We it, and the, we went through something like this in the 1880s and 1890s, for example, as you know. I think one of the reasons it, it's so dysfunctional is because we're so split as a country. And in the 1880s and 1890s, we had three presidential elections in a row that were essentially 50-50, and the voting, and that meant that there was everybody was sort of clawing for just small advantages. And, and it was a gilded age, and it was dominated by moneyed interests. Sounds familiar. Um, and, and, it, and it was bad politics. It was a really rough patch. But along came a group of young reformers, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, one of, the, one of the ones right there at the forefront, who was, instead of stepping back from the arena, jumped into the arena. Uh, you know, his parents didn't want to get him involved. They said, it was a, you know, getting involved in politics was the worst thing you could do except for acting. Uh, and, and they really wanted him to stay out of the, 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 the smoke-filled room. But he jumped in after he came out of Harvard. A lot of his uh, uh, colleagues, younger people, jumped in. They became the reformers. They gave us, you know, the, uh, the, the reform movement that included Woodrow Wilson, this progressive era. And we really cleaned up our politics. We got back on track. And I think, I think a, a new group of young people jumping in into the arena can make a huge difference. Let me tell you the story of just one young man. I, I, you may hear the story again tonight. Um, but I, I, I have the privilege of working with a lot of young people in Cambridge. And one of them was a young man I met when he was an undergraduate at Harvard. Uh, he graduated back in 2001. And uh, he gave the class day speech at, at graduation. And he asked the question, uh, what is the call to greatness for our generation? What is the call to greatness for our generation? And he didn't know. And he wasn't sure, but he wanted to give back to his country. So that summer, he signed up for the Marine Corps as an officer, infantry officer. And along came 9-11. And boom, he was off to the races, as you can imagine. So he went on the first, first wave into Iraq as an infantry officer with his troops. Um, he had three tours. Um, uh, just, just coming out of Harvard, had three tours. And when he finished the uh, three tours, he was going to come back and go to the business school and go to the county school. I, I helped to get a scholarship for him to come to the county school because was, I was mentoring him. And uh, after three tours, he was, he was all done. He's finished. David Petraeus got the tap to go lead all our forces in Iraq. And he called this young man and said, uh, I need your help. Can you put your uniform back on? Which he did. He volunteered, went back into service, had a fourth tour in a very dangerous situation, finally got out came to Harvard, got his business school degree, got his county school degree. So now he has three Harvard degrees and four tours in Iraq. Uh, turned down Goldman Sachs, uh, went to do a startup in Texas. His congressman, local congressman in Massachusetts, got into ethical trouble. and uh, He's a Democrat, and this young man was persuaded to go run for Congress, which he did. And he took on 
this Democrat, incumbent Democrat in a primary. Uh, no incumbent Democrat in, has been beaten in a primary in Massachusetts in over 20 years. And so this young man was up against the forces, and all, everybody in the Democratic Party opposed him. You know, all the establishment supported the incumbent. Uh, but this young man won. He won an upset, and then he beat a Republican. And now he's, a, he's newly in the Congress. His name is Seth Moulton. Uh, and he was, the New York Times just did a big profile of him. And, you know, what he's doing, he, he called a Republican and tried to live with him. Or, you know, have a house with a Republican. He's, he's done a variety of things with Republicans. He, does, he thinks, like a lot of members of his generation, that this stuff that we're going through right now is crazy, that the kind of politics we're going through is crazy. You know, if you fly, fight under one flag in Iraq, you damn well can try to govern under one flag back here. Um, and he's absolutely committed to getting there and doing it a different way. And, you know, the hell with the rest of the Democratic Party. If they're not going to go, they're going to be a new group of people coming in to do that. And that's what I salute. Let me tell you one more thing about him. When, the, when he was running for office, the Boston Globe, our newspaper, uh, tried very hard to get his military records because they wondered if he was inflating his story. Uh, it's a fair question. They, and he wouldn't give them to him. They, they finally got a copy, right, shortly before the election. And they found out he had been understating his military record. He had won two medals for heroism in Iraq and never told the voters. Never told the voters. Uh, and it turned out he hadn't even told his parents because he felt his enlisted guys deserved the medals as much as he did. And it was not right to brag about being in Iraq and winning a medal for heroism, so he didn't talk about it. That's a different kind of spirit than what we've seen in our politics for a long time. And I'm telling you, I think the new generation represents that kind of spirit, and it's what makes me so hopeful. We have time for a student question. Uh, your, your tech shot. Great. So you, you've heard it, uh, students. You're the future. This is the, the reason to give uh, all of us hope the millennials are going to save us. So tell us what you're worried about. Uh, this is your chance to have a conversation with our distinguished guest. Not everybody wants. <laughs> I'll be back. They'll let us speak for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Here comes the budding television journalist. OK, let's go for it, Jamie. Okay. Um, actually, you don't need a microphone. That's true. Well, this is a, this is a uh, you know, I, I think you can argue, in fairness to the president, you could argue this either way. I think he's been right in one sense, and that is to push very hard that we're not at war with Islam. That Islam is a religion that by its nature is not extreme. It is not as brutal uh, as what we're seeing. And that this is a group that's hijacked the religion. Um, Having said that, they are fighting us in the name of Islam. That's right. They, they, they proclaim themselves as Islamic. As Islamic. And so to call, them, to call this a struggle against extreme Islam does not seem to be wrong. In fact, it calls it the way it is. And I think that there are times in public life when you need to call it the way it is. You need to put names on things and people, uh, you know, they, they get it right. I, I worked for Ronald Reagan, and it, it was uh, at one point overseeing his speech writing team. And we had a speech written by a, a conserv very conservative writer on the staff. I'm less conservative than the president, the president was. And uh, but it was a fiery speech, and uh, it, I, I thought it went way beyond what was appro appropriate diplomatically. And uh, we, we managed to water down the speech. I took a lot of flack inside for getting it watered down. But I, I left in the phrase, and I, I questioned it, but, it, but I lost this one. Uh, and the president called, President Reagan called the Soviet Empire an evil empire. And it, that raised a lot, of, a lot of people objected to that. They thought it was inflammatory to call it an evil empire. I, and I objected to it at the time. I came to believe over time it was the right thing to do. It, you, you sometimes have to speak truths about 
reality in order for everybody to understand exactly what it was. And it was an evil empire. Uh, and this is Isla Islamic extremism. And I think we ought to call it for what it is. I think it looks weak. And it strikes people as weak when you sort of retreat from calling it what it is. I, 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 I applaud him looking at other ways to deal with ISIS. Clearly, we need a diplomatic set of answers, too. Clearly, we need to be working on long-term solutions to the, 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 why there's a culture that enables or encourages or uh, 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 somehow from which extremism springs. And that you, you have to change the culture by making sure that young men have jobs. Yeah, there are too many young men in the Middle East who don't have jobs. We have to empower women. That's extraordinarily important in the Middle East. Uh, we know that societies in which women have larger voices tend to be more peaceful. That just happens to be the case. Um, uh, we know that societies in which women are better educated uh, tend to be more peaceful. Um, and we need, to, we need to make you know, good on that. We have to sort of find, if we can, ultimately some answers for the Palestinians uh, so that they can have a state that lives in peace with Israel, but they have their state. Um, and so there's a lot of long-term stuff that has to be done. Uh, and I applaud all that. But to have a summit on, on terrorism, which does not include a military component, seems to me to be sort of like, what? How are you going to deal with these monsters who are, who are living and embedding themselves in a big chunk of territory in Syria and, and Iraq, and they're now metastasizing? into places like Yemen and now Libya, and you just saw the beheadings of Egyptians, you know, by, by the Libyan uh, uh, Islamic terrorists. Um, I, I just, I, I don't think, I don't think that we can just sit here and let that happen. And we ought, it's important to listen to our friends. I've been to the Middle East twice in the last few months. And what people in the, in the region will tell you is, look, you on repeated occasions, one nation, one ambassador said, six times you've asked us to get into a conflict on your side, to be part of an alliance on your side because you thought your interests were threatened. We've done there. We've been there every time. Now, we're in a situation where Islamic terrorism doesn't threaten you directly. It's not an existential threat to you, but it's an existential threat to us. And we need you to be here to deal with this. We've been there for you, and you need to be here for us. That, to me, is a very appealing argument. I must say that argument resonates with me. I mean, it seems to me that if, if we're going to be a leader, you, you've got to be willing to, to do some hard things. Now, what does that mean? I don't think it means we have to put a lot of troops on the ground. I do think we have to take the lead in forming an alliance. Uh, I think the Arab nations have to be, and maybe Turkey, have to be doing the work on the ground. But we have to have people on the ground in, in Syria to get this done. And the United States has to take the lead to put the coalition together. The United States has to take the lead in providing the air support, the, the intelligence, the forward planning. And, the, and you may have to put some special operation troops in there to get the, the bombing done right. Right now we've got some, but not very many. Uh, but we need to take action that sends a signal to would-be terrorists around the world that if you join this movement, you're going to die. There's a good chance you're going to die, and it is a losing movement. movement. So far, what we've seen are headlines and pictures dominated by ISIS beheading people or killing people by lighting them on fire. And they're apparently burying children alive. Uh, and what we, what we need are pictures of ISIS fighters throwing their weapons down and surrendering. So that people who around the world get a sense that this is a losing movement. The tide has turned. The momentum is on the side of, of people who are fighting for some sort of decent life. And I, I think we need to be at the lead in that. That to me, I, you know, I'm showing my colors now, but I'm just telling you. I, I think the, we, we've now got a, 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 a strategy that's called strategic patience. That's what the White House is telling us to have, strategic patience. Uh, some would call that dithering. So we have to get you to uh, Newark by tonight. And since this, <laughs> is, this is New Jersey, we're going to have to leave pretty soon. Um, but you, you, I think you, we have you, time you, you, for, you, for one last question. There, there's no bridge to close between here and there. That, well, <laughs> yeah. you know our traditions well. Okay, yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. You can have uh, the last word. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 
I, I, I think it's a serious issue that we need to, I, I think, look, there, there are two issues. One is the number of people in poverty, and we need to lift the floor for those people in poverty. That's not going to solve the inequality problem, but it, it's going to ensure that people have a decent uh, way to live. I happen to be in favor of raising the minimum wage, for example. I think that's only fair. The minimum wage has, has slipped in comparison to what it was. And people who, who are willing to work and work every day, I think, should get a minimum wage that takes them out of poverty. And if that doesn't work, let's go for the earned income tax credit in addition, which puts more money in the pocket. I think for, there ought to be an incentive to work. And if you work, you ought, to, you ought to be able to support your family. So that's fundamental. The other issue to me is not inequality per se. If that's occurring everywhere. The real issue is equality of opportunity. And we have to work much, much harder to ensure that every child, every family has an equal shot at progressing. That's what the Declaration of Independence is all about, to my way of reading it. And to me, that means, look, increasingly, upward mobility is has, has, has coming to a stop. And the biggest indicator of how a child will uh, fare in life is determined by the zip code into which they're born. So if you're born into a poor zip code, chances are very high you're going to remain poor all your life. And if you're born into a, uh, an affluent zip code, chances are you're going to be affluent all your life. That's not a quality of opportunity. And we, it, starts with this, it starts with preschool, and we have to be much, much tougher, stronger about that. But it also starts with K-12 uh, and the opportunities people have. It, it, it also means we've got to change. And I think one of the things the president's going to do, which is going to be good, is he's going, to, he's going to start addressing, through my brother's keeper, this organization he's formed after he's president, he's going to take on much more seriously the question of young black males. We have to address that problem. These children deserve a chance. They need to be read to at night. They need to have nutritious food. They need parenting. And there are too many of these in too many cases. White and black working people now, in too many cases, there's no father around. And we need, to, we need to have a culture which encourages fatherhood. And we saw we're, we're all sort of dancing gingerly around that question. And we need to take it on directly. It's just, it's just a fact of life. You father a child, you've got responsibility. And that's the culture. That's what's expected of you. And, and it, it, it is unfair to ask young women with a child, two children at home, to have to bear all the, to do all the struggles. It's just, it's not right. We ought to look up to those women. I think they're doing a magnificent job, but there got to be some fathers around. And that's part of the giving a, a, a child a chance. Uh, and we know if there are two parents around and, they're, and they're, at least one of them is working, the likelihood is that child's got a much better chance in life. Uh, so it is partly a question of improving the schools. I happen to be a big charter school fan. I think I'm a big Teach for America fan. Um, uh, but that's not the issue. The issue is how do we get our educational system and how do we get our families to take responsibility? And I, that, to me, is a question of trying to create a community. I think Hillary was right about that. It does take a village to raise a child. Uh, and uh, this is all of us have responsibility for these children in some way, but the mother and father have the key responsibility. David Jorgen. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us.